Hey everyone, I'm Anthony Fabian, the director of Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, and you're watching Hallmark Happenings. Thank you so much. Well, I really, really appreciate you talking with me. I was so excited. I just loved the movie and I've been on a bit of a director kick lately talking with directors. And so this is so much fun. I've listened to a lot of interviews and I'm hoping I ask things maybe you haven't been asked before. Um, that so would be we'll terrific. <laughs> yes. <laughs> before we get into the movie specifically, I would love to talk about your career and how you got into directing. I... The, my route into the film industry was initially as an actor. That's what I thought I wanted to do. And then I started to work a little bit in the profession and decided I didn't enjoy the whole business of auditions and having to um, not be in control of my fate, really. So I started writing. And then from writing screenplays, I also realized that actually the person who really gets to make the film is the director. So that's when I decided to put all my focus and attention on trying to be a director. And I started off working initially in the theater and then in opera for about five years to get more directing experience, blocking, working with actors, uh, in that case, singers. And then I started making short films and I lucked into a pretty well-paid gig doing music videos for a record company uh, at that time, the CD was a thing and record companies were flush with cash. And I made lots of classical music videos with classical recording artists and singers and performers. And that really enabled me to cut my teeth as a filmmaker. I also then started making short films and eventually found the subject for my first feature film, which was a South African true story called Skin. That's amazing. So it was just, it's an interesting journey. How um, I've heard a couple of other directors start in acting and it just wasn't quite for them, but they just love the industry and just love the process of making films. And then like you're saying, the director has their hand over everything. And it's so cool. I love hearing that. And now look at you with this amazing, huge film. That's so exciting. Congratulations on just having all this success. Thank you. Yeah, we seem to be um, unfolding nicely, shall we say. I completely agree. Um, is there maybe when you were younger, was there a movie or a TV show or anything that kind of really sparked your interest in just the industry in general? Well, it was strange because my mother was an actress and she was cast in a commercial and they were looking for a little boy to play her son when I was seven. And so I was invited to audition and amazingly, possibly typecasting, I got the part of her son in this commercial. And um, that day that I spent on set on the commercial, I was, it was just so thrilling for me. I, I found that I, that's when I thought I'd finally found my home where I wanted to be. So that was what really kind of sparked the whole, whole thing off. And then I was a complete film nut. So when I was at school, um, you know, from a very early age, I just loved watching animated films like 101 Dalmatians and The Lady and the Tramp, lots of Disney stuff. And then later when I was at school in, in boarding school, I used to, my dad was living in Paris and I used to go and visit him there and they had repertory cinemas there. So it was possible to see the work of directors dating all the way back from Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin all the way to the current films. And while he was working, I spent all afternoon in the cinema. So that's that was my real cinema education. That's so fascinating. That's interesting. So just from a very early age, you just you just love watching um, anything on the screen. I was the same way. I was like not an outdoorsy kid. I would just like my babysitter. I, I always joke uh, was just sitting in front of a TV because it's just so fun to see what's on there. It's so fascinating. <laughs> and it's funny. I didn't realize until I was about in sixth grade. I was like, oh, these are actual people. And like, there's a thing behind the screen going on. It's just really interesting because I think some people even grown ups technically don't realize the other side of it so it's fascinating yeah sure sure no I mean I think most people don't have any idea how films are made yeah do you have a favorite director or anyone's style you really admire well I have directors who are working today who I really admire like Alfonso Cuaron or Alejandro Iñárritu both Mexican directors um, I love Jacques Audiard French director um, Michael Haneke uh, who's Austrian those are the people who I really look up to who are working in cinema today. Um, but then, you know, I just love 
so many directors who are from the past, like Orson Welles, Stanley Kubrick, um, Max Ophuls. I mean, there are so many fabulous directors, Roman Polanski, who's working today, but not so much, and not really making films that I like so much, but I like his early work. Um, so, yeah, there's a huge range of directors whose work I admire. Bob Fosse, I liked his films very much. He's so many great uh, choices. I completely agree. So There's so many amazing directors, and you are definitely in line with all of them. This was just such a <laughs> wonderful movie. I was going to say, I don't know if you've noticed this. I'm sure you have. There are very few movies like this that often get to be on the screen. In the last 10 years, it's pretty much action movies, superhero movies, or just animated movies for kids. And I'm just like, where are these sweet movies like this? They are rare, a few and far between. Was that a reason maybe you felt kind of like drawn towards Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris? Not really. I uh, When I started working on it, nobody had any sense at all that it could be a success because, as you say, there was nothing really else like th this out there. And ultimately... It all comes down to the casting and can you find the right actor who will be of sufficient value for the financiers to say yes to your movie. And I was just very lucky that a producer called Xavier Marchand believed in the commercial potential of the film and he used his connections to, to get it financed. And then once we had the backing, we were able to secure the amazing Leslie Manville um, you know, who's just so perfect for the part. So, you know, it took a long time to get the script in great shape and it took a long time to find the right producer and financing entity and, and leading lady. But once all of those elements came into place, it just became a lot more inevitable. And then as far as the distribution is concerned, we were just unbelievably lucky that Focus um, fell in love with the movie because it was a bidding war between Focus and Netflix. And so this could easily have become just another streamer on Netflix. Not saying Netflix isn't great and amazing and has been a tremendous force in the film industry, but I don't think it would get the same kind of attention or, or be, as, be as highlighted as it has been through the intensive cinema release that Focus was interested in doing. That's so interesting you say that. Um, one, I feel like Focus Features makes some of the best movies. There's not really a movie that they make that isn't just lovely. And the kind of they have the similar quality in some of their movies, which is so fun to watch. But it's interesting about Netflix because you're, you're watching that on maybe your TV or your phone or computer. But this is a movie that was meant to be on the big screen. It's so visually stunning. So I'm so glad that you went that direction because I think it was absolutely the right choice. Yeah, well, you can thank E1, who were the financiers who made that choice and who decided to take a risk and make it a cinema film. And we are considered a little bit of a canary in the in the coal mine right now because nobody knows if this film will succeed in the against these blockbusters and you know Marvel movies and and action films. Um, but it does seem like there is an audience for us and they're discovering the film bit by bit and falling in love with it. And some people see it two, three, four, five times. And that's what's going to make other films like this possible to be shown in the cinema. Oh, a hundred percent. I think the audience for these types of movies has been so neglected in year, recent years. So I'm so glad this was brought to us and I hope you get to make more like this. I know there are <laughs> other books and I heard that maybe, maybe you might be working on the other books in the series. Is that something that has real potential? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pushing to get going on the screenplays for the other books. And I think there is definitely an appetite to make those films and and for the public to see those films and each one of these stories is a wonderful fish out of water adventure for Mrs. Harris. I love that I, she played the fish out of water so well this is my actually my next follow-up question so this is perfect Leslie Manville obviously has done more serious projects and is so well known for Phantom Thread which was just 
amazing, but she played this role in such like a sweet and endearing way, but she was still strong. And I thought she was like the epitome of what we should all try strive to be because she still stood her ground at Dior. She was like, I feel like I'm not being treated fairly and look where it led her. And she, she yeah. stood her ground in it like a sweet, positive way. But I was wondering, did you talk with Leslie at all about how you kind of wanted to display these qualities on the screen or did she just run with it? I think a lot of that work was done obviously by the screenplay. Um, you know, it wasn't an improvised film in any way. Um, but I think one of the reasons that we attracted somebody of the caliber of Leslie Manville was because she could see the potential of all the layers and levels that she could play with this character. And all credit to her, she certainly found those nuances um, and managed to bring a, a beautiful complexity to the character. I think she could have easily been just very sweet without all of the ballast and, you know, all of the the strength that she displays. And it is a story in which the character grows in confidence and strength as the, as the story progresses. So that was inherent in the screenplay. But I think she really managed to map out that journey in a very precise way. And she's a spectacularly well-prepared performer and requires very little direction uh, from me other than the merest fine tuning. And, you know, I couldn't have been luckier than to have somebody like that to work with and get through our schedule, which was really tight. Well, she was an absolute sweetheart. Incredible. I mean, the whole cast was just amazing. When you look at the list, you're just like, wow, these are some huge, huge names. When you finally got everyone involved, I mean, obviously Rose Williams, Jason Isaacs. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Were you like, I can't believe this is our cast? <laughs> <laughs> well, I always knew that Leslie would be a, something of a magnet for other actors, you know, because she's so well-respected and so well-loved in the industry. And she set the tone. We also were incredibly lucky that Isabelle Huppert committed to making the film. And in France, she's like Meryl Streep. You know, she, she you, you can't get more famous or, um, or, you know, respected than Isabelle. So we had Isabelle and Leslie to start with. And I think that really was a, a big attraction for the other characters. You know, Anna, Anna Chancellor is an incredible bit of luxury casting for Lady Dant. Um, a small character, but she brings so much to that role. And she's absolutely wonderful, as do all the characters like Jason and Rose, as you mentioned, Lucas and Alba. You know, they're all fabulous. Amazing ensemble cast, for sure. It was just, it was wonderful. I just loved every moment of it. Um, I actually, it's not shown in theaters where I am because I'm kind of in a smaller town. So I had to buy it ah. and I can watch it as many times as I want. But okay. um, <laughs> I used to live near, I'm sure you've heard of maybe the Angelica Film Center. They, yes. I would of course go see movies there. My first uh, movie I saw there was Atonement, which was just amazing. Oh, wonderful. A movie that this kind of had a similar look to, just because of the time period, um, was or Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day. Have you? I'm yes. sure you've seen that. Um, and then, of yes. course, um, recently, The Pursuit of Love, which uh, they all take place in a similar time era. Um, I was just going to say, I love these time eras. And I was wondering if there's something you love about the 50s. And I love Miss Pettigrew. I thought it was a brilliant film. Uh, it's also a focus film, I think. Um, and also based on a book and also with quite a dejected working class uh, character. So there are many, many parallels. Um, and But I think somehow Mrs. Harris has a, a different mood and tone to it. It's less there was a relentlessness about Miss Pettigrew and um, perhaps it was a little bit more fantastical and over the top in some of its tone. I think we have a slightly more grounded tone generally in Mrs. Harris. You mentioned The Pursuit of Love, is that right? That was directed by my friend Emily Mortimer and she was definitely going for something that felt very modern and um, contemporary at the same time as being of its period. And so she was using contemporary music and, you know, various things that I think were deliberately stylish and anachronistic. Whereas I think my film is a little bit more respectful of its period and it's modern in different ways. So for example, the fact that we cast her best friend as a Jamaican actress instead of a Cockney. It's true to the period there was a J Jamaican migration 
in the UK in the 50s, which which we uh, were inspired by. But it does make the film feel more of our times, I think, um, to, to have the diversity. Um, and I, I also made sure that the models at Dior were a diverse group of models. And Dior himself had an Asian model, a black model. So it wasn't, it wasn't historically wrong, but it just feels more appropriate for our times. That's interesting. Well, they each have their own unique style. I just, um, I just love these period films. I pretty much don't watch anything but those when I, uh, for my own personal enjoyment, but I agree. I love that you added the more um, diversity to it. It made it more interesting. It's more fun. It's just, it's so perfect for it and it's so needed. So I'm glad you added your own like kind of spin on things. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, uh, period films are the hardest to get made, funnily enough. They're the ones that the studios seem to want the least and even Netflix is resistant to period because it's expensive and it's complicated. And there's a perception that the audience isn't interested in, in period films, that the audience is only interested in contemporary, but as, as you prove, it's absolutely not the case. I hope I'm not the only one that just loves no, those pieces. <laughs> not at all, not at all, lots of people do. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. And I was going to ask you about the challenges of this because you have to be so specific. Like you're saying, especially um, you want it to be more accurate towards the actual time period and everything has to have such attention to detail. What was like the most challenging part of making this movie in regards to that? Well, we had a limited budget. So in terms of how many period cars we could have, how many extras we could dress in period clothes, um, we shot the film uh, primarily in Budapest. And so that presented its own challenges because, you know, we had to use a, a degree of magic, movie magic, CGI, to recreate Paris and London um, in Budapest. And also we had to choose our locations very carefully to make sure that they did look architecturally right for the different cities. Uh, but we did shoot in London and Paris as well, just to make sure that the authenticity of the film shines through and there are very key sequences that you know were in London and were in Paris that I think helped sell the idea that we are in those cities so that was certainly one of the big challenges of making the film. I can imagine well it turned out so wonderfully every every part of it was just beautiful on our screen so uh thank you for making this so I hope you make so many more um I was going to say something I know you've been asked about the Dior dresses but which Dior dress is your favorite? Oh, that's a good one. I, 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 I'm some, I'm somewhat torn sometimes because I love many of them. Um, I love the very first dress that comes out, which is the iconic bar suit, and I love the way that model wears that dress. I think it's really stunning. She is so so elegant and and um, moves with so much grace. And I also love, there's a blue dress called Caracas, um, which you see briefly, which is really, really stunning as well. Then there's the one called Vaudeville, which Alba wears, which has the black stripes around it, which is absolutely gorgeous. There's one that you may not have picked up on. It's a black ball gown, which is absolutely glorious, which you only see briefly towards the end of the sequence. Um, I think that one is magnificent. And the wedding dress. The wedding dress is very moving to me, the way Alba wears it, what's happening emotionally in the scene, everything about it is stunning. And if you see the dress itself, it's absolutely glorious with a giant silk bow at the back. Um, it's absolutely a wonderful dress. Oh he was goodness. genius, Christian Dior, he really was. Oh, 100%. I mean, uh, just the dresses themselves and then watching on the camera, the way you portrayed it was just like, you were paying tribute to these gorgeous dresses in such a beautiful way. I just want to add that Jenny Bevan created the story dresses in the film, which were inspired by Dior, but not exact replicas. And so, for example, the first dress that she sees in Lady Dance's bedroom, the green dress that she loves and then thinks um, she won't have in favor of the red dress, and then and then um, the red dress is, itself as well was inspired by a Dior dress, but not an exact replica. And I think Jenny did an incredible job of creating her own vision of Dior for those three storybook dresses. 
She absolutely did. If y'all don't get nominated for something, I will be absolutely shocked because it was incredible. I was going to say something. Oh goodness. Oh, the poster. I was going to ask you about the poster when you saw it for the first time. What were your thoughts? Because it is just too cute. It was so sweet. I think it really portrayed the energy of the film so well. What were your thoughts when you saw that? We were incredibly lucky that we had the doyen of the poster world, um, Blair Green, uh, at Focus, who was in charge of, of designing the poster. And he immediately was excited by all the different elements that we could bring to the design. Um, we had fabulous stills. Um, we had special photography uh, of all the key actors. And of course, there were the dresses and the sketches and lots of inspiration that he could draw from to create the poster. And we were initially presented with approximately 18, I think, different options. And the one that you see in the United States, the pink one, absolutely leapt out for me as by far the one that I preferred of all of the choices. There were many wonderful ideas, many beautiful things, different moods. But the pink one, I thought, really captured the fun of the film, the spirit of the film, the period of the film. Um, the joy of the character and allowed us to get a glimpse into some of the supporting characters as well. So I just loved everything about that poster over and above. It was really easy for me to single it out and say, that's the one. Interestingly, there are different countries around the world are choosing different options from that one. And I was very surprised that the UK has chosen um, what I consider to be perhaps a more conventional uh, poster but I've tried it out with some of my friends and all of my British friends prefer the UK poster so the marketing people obviously know exactly what they're doing and I'm really glad that they all agreed with my choice for the US because I love that and then you know each country will have its own ideal poster so it's a it's a very interesting process in terms of the, how these things are marketed and as a director, you could have your views, but you're not always right because you don't always know what individual countries will prefer. That's so interesting. Um, that's just another aspect of this that you just don't think about normally. So that's very interesting. I did see the other poster. I think it was for Germany, maybe. And that was beautiful as well. Definitely different look, but still lovely. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. The British one has the green dress that she's draping over herself. And then it has bands of London and Paris and it has a band of all the characters so it's much more descriptive if you like of, mm. uh, of the story and it's it's beautiful in its own way that's very true well um thank you so much for talking with me about all of this I very much appreciate it I wanted to finish up with um well one do you have any other upcoming projects or are you just trying to like maybe take a breather after making the movie and then the PR for the movie <laughs> No, I am actually preparing a new film at the moment, which is a comedic uh, ensemble piece. So in that sense, it's not too distant a cousin to Mrs. Harris, but it's only in the UK. So there's no traveling involved. Um, and it's a lot of fun, um, lovely script. And uh, hopefully we'll start shooting uh, in the next few months. And then I'm also preparing a film set in the ballet world, which is something that I've always wanted to do. So um, that's a much more epic uh, film. It's going to take a little bit longer to get it set up. So I'm really looking forward to getting onto that. So no, I'm definitely not taking any breaks. I'm, I'm going to make, make hay while the sun is shining. I think that's the best thing you can do. Uh, wow, that ballet movie is going to be just stunning. If you are involved, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> I cannot wait to see that. That's Thank exciting. You. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we'll finish up with a quick rapid fire question session. <laughs> Okay, fine. All right. Um, what is the last show you binge watched? Ooh, I don't do much binge watching, I have to admit. But I am sort of binge watching The Split, which is a, a wonderful BBC series. Check that one out, yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. And uh, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? Pistachio. <laughs> mm, that's a more popular answer than you would expect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's pure. It's a pure, awesome. it's a pure flavor, you know, some, something co more complicated than that is is less pure so i appreciate the purity of pistachio i have a question i've never had pistachio ice cream does it have actual pistachio like bits throughout yeah if you have to have the real thing like you don't want to have pistachio flavor artificial flavor you want mm. pistachio that's made with pistachios then it'll change your life 
<laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, and then um, you have traveled, you've lived so many places, which is so neat, but is there a place that you haven't yet visited that you would love to travel to? I would love to visit Iceland. I've never been to Iceland and I'm very curious to see what that's like. I've heard about it since childhood and I'm, I'm very curious about that country. Maybe there could be a Mrs. Harris goes to Iceland. That would be interesting. Yeah, why not? That'll <laughs> When we run out of countries, that'll be the next one she has to go to. And then she could wear lots of fur and different things to keep her warm. That would be fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, she does go to Moscow and it's pretty cold there. So potentially she'll be wearing fur in Moscow. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that will be fun to watch. Thank you so, so much for your time. Congratulations on Mrs. Harris goes to Paris and everything else you have in the works and all your past successes. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on this interview. I appreciate that. Well, I very much appreciate you and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. You look after yourself. You too. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Click that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of the previews, the recaps, or the interviews. Until next time, thank you so much for listening to Hallmark Happenings. Have a great day.